and that fills our hole so what we've done is we've widened it so that we can level it because this uh, bulkhead um, was not at the same level as where the, the turn was on this molded in bulkhead so we've just cut that off which created a bigger gap than we already had which becomes easier to fill with big stock so we'll just let the glue dry and then we'll sand that back and um, it should all look good okay so our next task is to tackle the terrace bar which on the model is this cutout area here so if you wanted to do this simply you would paint this little strip that has got a cutout in in a, a dark wood brown and that would represent your bar now when we put the deck above it on which locates like so um, you can see that we've got an okay looking bar area but we've got nothing behind it whatsoever um, so that that's no good it's just hollow uh, but it's also the, the wrong shape so I'm going to modify this and we're going to try and make this look um, a bit more like the actual thing um, and that starts with chopping this out Okay, that's the bar gone. Let's build a bar. So if you look at this picture, you'll see the um, bar. You'll also see that we have uh, a wooden door that needs to be installed there uh, next to the staircase. So we're gonna put the wooden door in. Uh, we also, this triangular section, which is the kit bulkhead here, going to thin that down to straighten it up because that is going to be our leading edge. If you look at um, how it works, there's um, a bit of wall at this angle, then there's another bit of wall at a different angle with the door on, and then the back of the bar comes off from there. So that's what we're going to do. Um, so we're going to start by making, by thinning this bulkhead out. Um, and we can simply do that with... Um, our chisel like so so there we go um, and then what we'll do is we will cut a nice straight edge on this um, and butt it against it. So using our grid we can trim a nice straight edge Mark out where that finishes.
Okay. So that gives us our initial bulkhead. Um, and then we can mark off the height. Okay, so that is our first bit of bulkhead in. I just need to give that a little bit of support. I'm just going to cut some angle, which we can use as a support for the bulkhead. Screw that in. There we go. It's a little long, so I'm going to just trim it back a little bit, just a fraction. Glue that in. Okay, so that's our base wall in. Um, I'm just going to put the deck on that goes above it. And that's going to allow me to mark out the end of that deck for reference on the deck below. So no, I'm not going beyond that pencil line. So we've got a bar, and then we've got a little um, cupboard that's got sort of um, towels and seat cushions and even a little stainless steel sink in it. So we've got that to, to look at as well. Um, and let's deal with the back wall next job. So the back wall runs in the same line as the bar. And the bar is running from this line like so. So that's our bar line. So our back wall is going to run on the same line. So if we something like that, there's not a lot of space behind that bar. And then we want another, we have some stainless steel boxes that go behind there and then we have the bulkhead immediately behind it so that's how we're going to build it up so we're going to start by putting these um, stainless steel boxes in which will add some strength to the structure um, and then we'll put the back wall in um, now we can have it shutters down which is stainless steel or we can have it shutters open, which means we've got some shelves to put in. Um, I think what we're going to do is have it shutters open. Um, and then I think we're looking all right then, aren't we? So let's get a cut strip.
I've marked out the footprint of the bar area now. Um, we've got a little cupboard going in there. Um, the little dot you can see is actually a little rectangular um, steel support that goes from floor to ceiling. Um, that's the back of the bar, that's the front of the bar. Um, so uh, we've got um, the bar actually wraps around that side there. So the actual bar surface comes down here and then there's a curve in it and it comes down here and meets this back wall. Um, so uh, I don't know whether the bar staff can get out of there or not. I think they have to go through this door. Um, and then what you actually have is a wooden door there which goes through to a stainless steel door behind it. So, um, yeah. So we've cut our stainless steel boxes that are behind the bar um, to length. And what we're going to do is we're going to glue that in. But I just want to mark off the uh, chamfer that we need to put in. There we go. So we can just cut that through with a razor saw. I just need to put an angle ever so slightly into that. Okay, we can glue that in now. We need a bulkhead to go in the back there, like so. So we can mark that off now. Just want to straighten up that edge first. Then we know we've got a good joint. Okay, so actually, that bulkhead is leaning backwards ever so slightly. So I'll just make an allowance for that. Deliberately putting this slightly on the long side so I can trim it back. Yeah, that's about right. So just need to mark off the height now and then we can get that in. Okay, and that is our bar back wall just going to go in like so just glue that in Now there is a little strip that goes up the middle which is actually dark wood so 
Um, I think we're now at the point where we need to be doing the dark wood bit next, so let's have a look at that. Okay, so we can start by just cutting it to length. Um, so I have some walnut strip here, as we've used the same stuff that we've used for making the wooden doors. So we've cut that to the right height. Now for me, it is probably a little wide. Ever so slightly wide. So I'm just going to cut a little bit off the edge just to make it a little narrower, just a tiny bit. And that should make the uh, shelf side look a lot better. There we go. So what we'll do is we'll just give that a dab of super glue and glue that in. Um, but we want to do the painting first, so that's probably the next task. Before I go any further, I just want to level all of this so it sits the the deck above it sits nicely. I'm using a 600 grit here. Just test fit that deck. Okay, we've leveled the top, so my next task is to just mark out where the wooden deck finishes because that uh, we don't want to leave a gap. So even though it's not perfectly right for the bar, that's the angle we're going to have to use. So I'm just going to draw that in. Whilst our blue paint is drying, I can just cut to length the basis of our bar now the bar is slightly higher than our little silver cabinets that we're, we're going to be putting in so what I need to do is build it up a little bit and of course it's also a solid wood bar, so that's what we'll build it up with. We'll build it up with some walnut, and uh, then it'll look quite authentic, won't it? So to ensure we get a really nice snug fit with the bar, um, I want to put the deck in now. So I'm just going to do uh, another dry fit. We appear to have a slight fit issue in this corner here. So as I uh, press that down, you can see it's forcing itself up on both the sides. I don't know if you can see that. Um, it's just slightly wider than the space provided. So what we're going to do is we're just going to 
run our knife along here and scrape this a little bit thinner, um, which should solve that problem. If you take, because these um, are slightly triangular, if they've taken the top dimension, um, it'll be slightly off at the bottom. Right, I think we're ready to put that down. So. Nice and clean. Make sure I've got nothing on my hands. reason why I'm folding it like that is so it's easier to put it into the center. Managed to scrape the side of one of the little jacuzzis. I'm going to go around with the end of a closed pair of tweezers just to press it down. Right up against the edge. Okay, that is our 
wood deck in. So happy with that. And that gives us a building edge now for our bar area. So I'm just going to go around, make sure we've got no raised edges along that edge, which we haven't. So the only bit that doesn't look perfect for me is these two little um, wings that stick out. Um, the deck orientation is, sl is slightly off to the kit part, and that's probably to do with the kit railings. Um, so uh, it is what it is. I will leave it at that, and then when we put the railings in, it'll be less noticeable anyway. Okay, so we now have our basic bar shape. You can see that um, it's wider at one end of the other, and that's because of the original kit part and the fact that we've got to work with the deck. So the next thing to do is to cover this in um, some wood strip. So if we cut a couple of those, that'll do a front face and the top of the bar actually overhangs. So if we do a third one, we can laminate two together to give us a nice overhanging bar. Um, it's got a sort of a rolled top that looks quite thick. So that's those pieces. And then we need to do the edge now. It's not quite wide enough, so we cut it oversize again. We can then sand it down and blend it all in. So, again, if we do three of those, now my guess is that it's not wood on the inside of the bar but I can't find any reference of the inside of the bar. So my thought process is to do it stainless steel on the inside. So when we paint our boxes, we can paint the inside of our bar stainless steel. So I think that's the next job, and then we can start gluing this um, wood on. I'm using the same stainless steel color that we've used for the propellers. Um, and various other little bits throughout the build, the um, MIG Metal um, 0191, which is such a nice um, stainless steel colour. And you can see brushes like a dream. Give that a second coat in a moment. Let's do the inside of this bar next. Okay, leave that to dry for a moment. Good morning to you, ladies and gentlemen. How lovely to see you all here this morning. Thank you very much for coming. And of course, our speaker is the designer of this wonderful ship. He's given some fantastic talks already. This is his final talk this morning. And it's all about the genesis of Queen Mary II, how it was built, why it was built, and what is so special about making it an ocean liner. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Stephen Payne. Thank you. Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It gives me enormous pleasure to welcome you here to the Royal Court Theatre. And thank you so much for foregoing a few hours' sun to come and listen to the lecture this morning. And of course, it's a special lecture 
for me because it's all about my baby, this ship. So we're going to start on a cold September night, way back just after midnight on September the 25th, 1967, when passengers standing on the deck of a ship crossing the North Atlantic noticed a solitary red dot. And initially they thought the red dot was the planet Mars or some other heavenly body, but as they focused their attention on the red dot, they realized that it was in fact a ship a ship on a parallel but opposite course to their own. And after a few minutes, the red dot became a red glow, and they could see that that was attributable to a ship with two red and black funnels that were brightly illuminated. And looking over their shoulder, they could see that the ship they were on had three red and black funnels that were similarly illuminated. And that event, just past midnight on the 25th of September 1967, was the last time the venerable Cunard Queens, Queen Elizabeth and Queen Mary met in Mid-Atlantic. And everybody said that that would be the beginning of the end of the transatlantic service. The Queen Mary had already been sold to the city of Long Beach and the Queen Elizabeth would last just one more year before she too would be sold. And there was a new queen under construction, the Queen Elizabeth II, but the expectation was that when that ship left service, that would be the end. There would be no more transatlantic crossings by Cunard ships. And what I like to think is that my colleagues at Cunard the people in my office that work with me, and our dear friends, the shipyard that helped to create this ship, that collectively we've rewritten history. And when I give this lecture to youngsters at school, trying to gear them up to have some ambition in life, I say that for me, being able to say that I've changed the course of history is a really powerful incentive. And it's something that I think is very, very special to instill in young people. So how did I become interested in ships? Well, it began by watching the venerable BBC television programme, Blue Peter. And Valerie Singleton, she joined the Queen Elizabeth on a trip from Cherbourg to Southampton. And she went up to the bridge, she went down into the engine room, through the public spaces, and I was absolutely captivated by this. And I knew then that when I grew up, I wanted to design and build something even bigger and better than the Queen Elizabeth. And I've been able to trace the date of that transmission that I saw on grainy black and white television way back. And it was the 24th of May, 1965. So I was a five-year-old watching that program. Such was the power of television. So here's our dear friend, the Queen Elizabeth, that started my interest. And we'll see a bit more of her in a moment. And of course, my interest in passenger ships grew more and more when in June 1969, my family and I visited Southampton and we were able to go on board the then brand new Queen Elizabeth II. Although she didn't quite look like this, she was then a steamship rather than the motor ship we see here. Now a big event happened in January 1972 and again it was Blue Peter. Because on the 9th of January 1972 they started their programme at five o'clock, and then suddenly they stopped and they said, there's something happening in Hong Kong, so we're going to have a satellite link direct to Hong Kong, and there in the harbour was our old friend, the Queen Elizabeth, on fire and sinking. 
And sadly, it was an act of arson. The ship had been sold by Cunard and eventually ended up with a Chinese businessman who wanted to convert it into a floating university. And unfortunately, some of the mainland Chinese were not too enamored with his plan, and so they set fire to the ship, and it was a total loss. Well, Blue Peter each year produced a book, and the 1972 Blue Peter Annual was an eagerly awaited present for me for Christmas that December in 1972. And of course, it had a feature all about the Queen Elizabeth. Had a wonderful sectional profile detailing what it was like in the ship, even a comparison of size between the Queen Elizabeth and the new QE2. And there was an informative narrative. But it was the last paragraph that really set me going. And it said, it was a sad moment for everybody that loves great ships. The superliner, no, the Queen Elizabeth was a superliner, and nothing like her will ever be built again. So as a 12-year-old that from the age of five had set his sights on actually doing that, for none other than Blue Peter, who we all respected and revered, how on earth could Blue Peter tell me that I wasn't going to achieve that ambition? So I'm just test fitting the um, wood deck that goes on the promenade here. Um, and as you can see, um, the fit is lovely. Um, but we do have space at the front. That's because we had plastic railings which means we do have a little bit of wriggle room in the deck. So to ensure that we're getting the deck down really nice and tight, I want to um, put in the um, rooms that go against here so that we've got it all buttered correctly. Um, we have further deck that goes in this section here and then deck that goes on the end here. So... Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to lift the camera up so that you've got a better view, which means you'll be a bit further away, but you'll be able to see what's going on, uh, hopefully. Um, my plan of attack is to put this piece of deck in first. Uh, and what we'll do is we'll peel back to about there um, and slide that into place and then slowly peel the rest of it back and put it down. Um, but before we can do any of that we need to give this surface area a good clean of any dust and debris um, so nothing difficult about it just making sure you've got all the dust off so that there's nothing going to get in the way of your deck sticking and then good to go along with a little brush and get any of the um, stubborn debris, if you like, away, and we can brush that away as well. And then a good way of checking is to run your finger along it, and if you've got nothing on your finger, you know you've done a decent job. So, as I've explained before, we can't slot this in as it's intended. It has to slide in, and that's because this part here that sticks out um, has to slide under there. And then once you've got it aligned to its location holes, it will just plop into place. So there we go. Um, now there is a support that goes in the middle that stops it wiggling around, so it's probably worth putting that in.
Okay, hopefully that will hold us square. Okay, so rooms are in, albeit temporarily. So we want to get some deck on next. So. Doesn't look like it's going to be too big an issue to fit. So, biggest issue is me actually being able to see it with the camera and the light in the way. Uh, yeah, okay, so. Let's start. first bit is the trickiest bit because we've actually got to feed it in and the adhesive is likely to want to fight back a little bit so I'm just going to use a tweezer to steady it as we feed it in Do the other one and then I'll come back to you to do the back end. Means we got it aligned okay. Well, it just so happened that at school in South East London, Cat for Boys, we were learning how to write letters. And my English teacher, Pat Bootle, who's still alive, she was teaching us how to write letters of complaint because she said, if you can effectively complain, you may well get what you want. And so for homework, we were charged with writing a letter of complaint about something that had annoyed us. So I wrote mine to Blue Peter, and of course I sent it off. And none other than the editor of Blue Peter, Biddy Baxter, replied. And she said, oh, we all enjoyed reading your letter. Great ideas, but don't be disappointed if you never achieve it. And when I give this talk again to the youngsters at schools, I say, well, throughout life, you have various disappointments. And part of being a stronger person is learning how to cope with such disappointments and taking advice and moving on. And of course, I really hoped that I 
would get a gold Blue Peter badge for writing in and telling them that when I grew up, I was going to design and build this great ship. Very precocious. And inevitably, I received the lowly Blue Blue Peter badge that you were given just for writing into the program. So my progression was, as I said, I went to Catford Boys School and my careers service at the school, they said to me, don't become a naval architect. They said, you'll never get a job. Engineering in the UK is finished. Become a chemist, because I really enjoyed chemistry at school. And so with no family members ever having been to university, and with the advice of the school not to go and do engineering and naval architecture, I started at Imperial College doing chemistry. And it was my physics master, Justin Johnson, who caught up with me after a year. And he said, you know, I was prevented from giving you the advice that I wanted to give you to say that you should forego what the school was telling you. You really should go and become a naval architect and follow your dream. And with his help, I managed to change course from Imperial and go to the University of Southampton where I studied naval architecture. And once I qualified, I became part of the Carnival's group of new building specialists. And I eventually became their chief naval architect. So let's talk now a little bit about how this ship evolved. Well, a lot of this ship really is tied to the Titanic. And in 1985, Robert Ballard discovered the wreck of the Titanic. And that really generated a huge amount of interest in that ship. And then in 1997, of course, James Cameron released his film Titanic, which was a huge blockbuster. Now, at the time, sadly, Cunard was not in the best of shape. The Trafalgar House Company that had owned Cunard for many years had been bought by another company, the Caverner Group, and Caverner really just wanted to sell Cunard because the only part of Trafalgar House they were really interested in was their construction business. And nobody really wanted Cunard because QE2 was beginning to show her age and there wasn't really anything to focus on. But once that Titanic film came out, bookings surged on QE2 to the point that Carnival thought that, well, perhaps Cunard might be a good investment. And so in 1998, Carnival bought Cunard, and I was then given the $1 billion to actually design and build this ship. 